So thank you all for coming. And I, I'm absolutely delighted to have Christina here. So uh, Christina will be our speaker today. Um, she is a staff radio astronomer at the US Naval uh, Research Laboratory in Washington, DC. And her research focuses on using radio frequency imaging to study distant galaxies and supermassive black holes. And she's especially interested in using radio telescopes um, such as the VLA to understand how supermassive black hole jets influence galaxy evolution. Um, and you might have seen uh, recent press um, on the subject, and, and it's the topic of today's talk. Um, Christina obtained her PhD from New Mexico Tech in um, 2015, and uh, she was then an NRC postdoc fellow at NRL. And she um, previously had uh, postdoctoral positions um, at Astron in the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy and uh, NRAO in Charlottesville. And uh, I was really impressed. Um, she recently organized the VLAS multi-wavelength conference, which some of you might have attended in the hybrid format, which is extremely challenging. Um, and sadly, I wasn't able to attend, but I was really uh, impressed by the organization and goals of that conference. And I'm really uh, excited about the potential for large scale synoptic surveys in the radio regime and their synergy with other multi wavelength surveys uh, in the study of AGNs. And uh, Christina is a real expert in that area. So I, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to introduce her to you today. And uh, the floor is yours. All right. Wow. Thank you so much, Shovita. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen. All right. Does that look okay to everyone? Yeah, that looks great. All right. Fantastic. Uh, well, thanks again, Shavita, for the very nice introduction and for organizing this, uh, th this really valuable AGN talk series. All right, so this talk uh, is based on a recent study that I led of quasars that were known in the optical and infrared, uh, but appear to have suddenly switched on in the radio in the past 10 to 20 years. And uh, the results of this talk, if you'd like to, to read about them in more detail, uh, please check out um, the paper shown here, Nyland et al. 2020. Um, I, this, this, uh, um, uh, screenshot also highlights the long list of, of collaborators who've uh, helped with this project and, and helped to make it possible. Okay, so I'll start with a synopsis. So how did we find jets that have recently switched on? Uh, the basic strategy was to compare images taken from different radio surveys uh, using the Very Large Array, or VLA. Yeah, so a picture of the VLA, for those of you not familiar, is shown here. And uh, it consists of 27 radio antennas linked together uh, as, a, as, as an interferometer. And it, it is, um, I think of it as the most powerful and flexible radio telescope uh, in the entire world. And uh, uh, the VLA has embarked on uh, a few surveys of the, of the uh, large uh, radio surveys of the sky in the past couple of decades. And so two of those uh, key surveys are first, the faint images of the radio sky at 20 centimeters and VLAS, the VLA Sky Survey. I'll tell you a little bit more about these surveys later, but for now, the important thing to know is that they have uh, roughly similar properties. Um, it's really just this large gap in time of, of, of 10 to 20 years between the two surveys that makes it interesting. Now in the animated GIF on the right, I have uh, a few examples of quasars from the study that I'll be talking about that really highlights their uh, non-detections in first, and then the presence of a, of a bright, uh, clearly detected uh, point source uh, 20 years later in VLAS. And the most promising explanation for these sources is, is that they represent uh, newborn radio emitting jets, um, as, as shown in these uh, beautiful artist illustrations here. All right, so here's, uh, here's my outline. I'll start out with uh, some background information on, on radio AGN and why they're interesting. I'll talk about identifying young radio jets. 
Uh, I'll then go into more detail on the sample that I've specifically been working on using uh, comparing first and VLAS. And then uh, if there's time, I'll talk about some future prospects. All right, so as, uh, as you all know, uh, in, in this group, AGN are among the most energetic objects in the universe. And in some cases, they can outshine entire galaxies by orders of magnitude. Now, a subset of AGN, um, personally, my favorite subset of them, uh, are referred to as radio loud. Uh, so it's about 1% to 10% is a fraction that are radio loud, radio loud, which means they're capable of launching jets of relativistic electrons that emit via synchrotron radiation. Um, now radio jets and lobes can reach scales of, uh, they can reach very large scales of hundreds of kiloparsecs over time scales of millions of years, and they can extend far beyond their host galaxies. And that's really illustrated nicely here in this uh, composite image um, with um, optical HST data in the background, and then um, radio continuum emission taken with the VLA shown here in pink. All right, so uh, so radio AGN are, are really cool, uh, but you know why why are they important uh, to science and society? Uh, so this is is my my own unique uh, perspective and take on it. Uh, so the the first uh, use case of of radio AGN that I'd like to highlight to you is is for human exploration, and so uh, radio AGN actually serve as beacons uh, for navigation. And they're also, uh, they, they comprise the, the database of calibrators used for, um, for, for radio astronomy. And so here's just a nice illustration uh, showing uh, the International Celestial Reference Frame, which consists of uh, thousands of, of radio emitting AGN, radio quasars. Um, and uh, this reference frame is, um, uh, is essential for, uh, for things like position, uh, positioning, navigation, and timing. Uh, uh, another reason why radio AGN are important is that they allow us to probe extreme physics. Um, so they, they really allow us to study um, fundamental extreme physics in, under conditions which we can't recreate here on the Earth. Uh, and that includes uh, the, the physics of supermassive black hole accretion, gravitational waves, cosmology, uh, etc. And the uh, cutout images shown here on the right are of M87. And uh, so uh, on the uh, leftmost one, is this is an image uh, at low radio frequency taken with a telescope called LOFAR or the low frequency array. Um, and the middle panel here, zooming in uh, many orders of magnitude, this is an image taken with the, the very long baseline array or VLBA. Uh, and, and here you can really see the, uh, uh, the jet. There are actually movies of, of blobs of plasma moving down this jet that you can uh, that you can watch. Happy to share a link to that later. And then over here on the right, this is the, the famous uh, uh, ring of emission taken with the Event Horizon Telescope of M87. All right, so uh, the, the final reason why radio AGN are important is uh, um, their influence on galaxy evolution. So uh, AGN are believed to have uh, driven the reionization of the universe, um, uh, you know, at high redshift. And uh, they also more generally, we know that radio AGM uh, play a, a significant role in generating energetic feedback. Um, and to just to expand on, on um, their role in, in influencing galaxy evolution, these are just a couple uh, highlights of, of, uh, of galaxies where we believe uh, energetic feedback is taking place in the, in the so-called radio mode. So, um, so these are optical images. And then the blue traces X-ray emission, and the pink is is uh, is radio emission. And so in these two famous examples, uh, Cygnus A and MSO 735, uh, the lobes are actually regulating star formation by heating ambient uh, gas in the intercluster medium, and uh, this, this inhibits uh, the formation of cooling flows that would ultimately form new stars. Uh, just a little bit more. Um, background evidence on why we believe EGN feedback is, in a, is important to galaxy evolution. Uh, this is the famous uh, 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 supermassive black hole mass velocity dispersion relation, the M sigma relation. Um, and uh, it's this relation, this 
tight correlation is believed to um, be uh, uh, come about due to AGN feedback, including um, feedback from jets and lobes. Um, and then on the right here, this is the this is a cartoon of the galaxy luminosity function or the number of galaxies per luminosity and volume bin. Um, and uh, the y, the x-axis is galaxy luminosity, which is a proxy for mass. Uh, and you can see that there are, are, are two colored curves on this cartoon. There's a red one uh, that has uh, uh, no AGN feedback. And then there is a the actual observed one in blue. And you can see that uh, they, they don't match. And in order to uh, 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 account for that difference, one needs to invoke AGN feedback in cosmological simulations. OK, so we've established uh, that AGN are important. Uh, radio AGN are particularly important for feedback. And um, I, I showed some cool uh, images of radio lobes. But we, we really have come a long way in understanding large scale radio lobes and their role in galaxy evolution. But where we really need to make progress is, is understanding um, how they have formed uh, and how they behave sort of at earlier stages in their life cycles, so how they interact with the surrounding medium. And of course, we'd like to know how um, how jets have, have uh, and their influence on their influences on their uh, surrounding uh, environments, such as their host galaxies, how that's changed over cosmic time. All right, so so I'm really interested in jets on subgalactic scales. And uh, the the overarching driver is in in try in studying compact uh, kiloparsec scale jets is that uh, they may uh, interact with the surrounding ISM and produce feedback, and that may be important for galaxy evolution. Uh, so on this slide, I just have a this is an example case study of a nearby galaxy, NGC twelve sixty six, where we believe uh, jet ISM feedback may be may be occurring. So the center panel here, this is an HST optical image. Uh, and then the white contours trace uh, VLA radio continuum emission at five gigahertz. And this is just a tiny little jet. It's one kiloparsec uh, in extent. But um, uh, this is an interesting system because uh, it actually harbors a multi-phase AGN-driven outflow. And that outflow is, is uh, prevalent in molecular, it can be seen in uh, the molecular phase and CO data. Uh, there's also, it's also apparent in H1 absorption. So this blue shifted component here um, actually gives us the geometry and tells us that gas is flowing out of the system. Uh, and then there's also an ionized component as well. So jet ISM feedback is possible, um, is, is sort of the takeaway of this slide. Uh, simulations also support, uh, uh, suggest that jet ISM feedback may be important. Um, so, so these uh, uh, figures here are taken from some really nice radio jet simulation studies led by Dipanjan Mukherjee. And um, uh, on the leftmost panel here, this is sort of the initial conditions of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the initial gas density. Um, in the center panel, this is a, a low power jet, 10 to the 44 ergs per second. And then on the right panel is a jet that has a, a power that's 100 times, uh, 100 times more than that. And uh, the interesting takeaway is that the lower power radio jet actually influences a larger volume of the ISM. And, and also it, it has an influence for a longer amount of time. So this is a snapshot at three mega years and this on the right, um, the snapshot's taken at 0.79 mega years. Uh, so powerful jets actually drill through their surroundings yeah, quickly and the lower power jets may um, interact with their ambient mediums and, and influence the conditions more. So um, it is important to study radio jets in, um, in more diverse regimes than we've traditionally been studying them throughout history. And so some of the questions that I'm really seeking to answer um, with the work I'll be showing you are, how often are radio jets triggered, especially at high redshift? Uh, what are some of the mechanisms that uh, might control or influence that triggering? Uh, how long do radio jets live for? What are their you know, lifespans and, and duty cycles? And then do uh, compact jets have an important influence uh, on galaxy evolution? Uh, and so really what's needed to make progress is uh, systematic searches for young jets in large surveys. All right.
Uh, so identifying young jets. Um, so uh, this is just to give you a little bit more background on the, the physics of, of young jets, um, to put things even more uh, in context. So uh, the brightest young radio jets um, with fluxes of hundreds of millijanskis or so, they've actually been studied for decades. And there's a lot of extensive literature on the subject. I listed a few reviews along the bottom of this slide that you can check out for, for more details. Um, now, uh, you know, this, all of this previous work means that we really have a good understanding of how they evolve and, and change with time. Um, and so on this slide in the left panel, um, this is a, a graphical picture of how the uh, radio luminosity and size uh, change with time. Uh, so uh, young jets um, brighten until they reach approximately kiloparsec scales. So they, in, in this phase of their lives, uh, this includes classes like GPS sources, which stands for gigahertz peak spectrum. And then as they uh, extend beyond uh, roughly a kiloparsec or so, uh, they, uh, their luminosities decrease while they continue to expand. Um, and then this eventually leads to uh, uh, classes like CSS, which stands for compact steep spectrum, as well as the traditional FR1, FR2, uh, classical radio sources. Um, on the right here, so this is uh, flux versus frequency. So this is the how the spectral shape changes. So young jets uh, start out, uh, they, this, this plot goes right to left actually. So they start out having curved radio spectral energy distributions that peak at high frequency. Um, and then the those uh, spectral shapes, the peaks shift to lower and lower frequency with time. And uh, eventually, both of these uh, plots converge on, uh, you know, going from a compact subgalactic jet um, to potentially a larger scale source if it survives long enough. So to identify young jets, uh, three key aspects of them, to, uh, th three key features to look for are uh, compact morphology, if you have high resolution imaging, with usually with uh, VLBI, very long baseline interferometry. You can also look at their radio spectral curvature if you have broadband radio data. And then finally, you can look at variability since they actually can change over time scales of, uh, of years to decades by significant levels. Uh, so here, uh, I'll go through a few examples of each identification method. So um, morphology. So here's an example of a, a young uh, peak spectrum source. Uh, so, so this is uh, taken from the recent review by Odea and Psychia, 2021. And um, this, this figure has, has a lot of labels. And on the right here, this is actually a, um, a plot showing changes in positions. So proper motions were possible for this source to determine um, in age, an expansion age. Uh, so this source is about a thousand years old. Uh, but this just uh, is to give you a feel for, um, you know, how, how these sources look um, at high uh, angular uh, radio, in high high angular resolution radio imaging with telescopes like the VLBA. Um, now, now it is ex it would be great if we could get uh, milliarc second scale resolution images for for all uh, radio AGN out there, but it is uh, currently not feasible to do that. So another way to try to find uh, young radio jets is to look for their characteristic peaked spectral shapes. So uh, this is a, uh, a a another cartoon that you may find useful. Uh, so again, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, the radio spectra of young uh, radio AGN they start off in the first thousand years or so having uh, peaked spectral shapes. Um, over, over time, those peaks uh, transition to lower frequencies. Um, so here, this, this source is peaking in the gigahertz peak, uh, regime as a GPS source, gigahertz peak spectrum. As it gets older, the peak moves to the megahertz regime, and some people call them megahertz peak spectrum sources. Uh, and then um, after, uh, on the order of thousands of years, uh, until it fades away after millions of years, uh, you, you see a simple just optically thin power loss spectrum for old sources. Uh, so now, as you can kind of see from this plot, you, uh, uh, you really need uh, measurements in frequency spanning a wide range 
And usually it's difficult or impossible to, to tease out the shape from a single radio observation. So one solution is to combine data from different radio surveys and then um, use those measurements uh, to model the radio spectral shape. And so this is a, a nice example of that from a recent paper by Pallavi Patil. And um, so this is uh, sensitivity versus frequency. And then a variety of radio surveys are shown. Um, there's VLAS here on the lower right. And um, uh, in the inset here, this is an example of a modeled radio spectrum. And Pallavi has some really nice uh, uh, fitting tools on GitHub that you can check out if you're interested. Uh, here's another example of a, a source modeled uh, using uh, Pallavi's uh, code, actually. Uh, but this is a source um, identified in uh, uh, a variety of different surveys with, with acronyms I won't go through in, in agonizing detail. Um, but the, uh, the point is this source peaks in the megahertz regime. It's an MPS source, megahertz peak spectrum. And uh, this tells us that it is... Um, probably on the order of 10,000 years old. And uh, this, incidentally, this, this figure here, uh, it, it is um, sort of a way for me to sneak in a plug for V-Light, which is the VLA low band ionospheric and transient experiment. It's a commensal 340 megahertz system on the VLA. If you've had recent VLA observations, you probably have V-Light data uh, available for your source. So get in contact uh, feel free to get in contact with me to, to learn more about um, uh, how to access those products. All right, so uh, the third uh, technique for identifying compact uh, potentially young jets is variability. Uh, and so this is an example of a, um, of, a of a of an AGN that had radio data taken over a couple different ep uh, epochs spanning uh, several years. And the shape of the radio spectrum is actually changing. Uh, so it's going from, from, from black to red. So the, the peak is uh, uh, evolving with time. And uh, this particular AGN uh, has evidence in the optical and optical spectroscopy for some variability. And so one possible explanation is um, a change in accretion state is actually unfolding. Um, and so there may be some connection between young and compact jets and uh, changing look or changing state AGN. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit um, about uh, the sample that, that I'll be focusing on. So I'll skip over that slide and move right along to the very large array sky survey or VLAS. So VLAS is a, a large survey of the entire northern sky above a declination of minus 40 degrees. And it's actually the third large survey conducted by NRAO with the VLA. And that's following on the footsteps of uh, NVSS and FIRST, um, which were taken at lower angular resolution as shown here. Um, it, and yeah, it, just uh, take in, appreciate for a moment the, the huge difference in resolution between four, uh, NVSS, which has 45 arc second angular resolution, first with five arc second resolution, and VLAS is 2.5 arc second resolution. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 is, it is amazing. There are plenty of AGN whose morphologies will be revealed for the first time by VLAS. Now, unlike uh, NVSS and FIRST though, um, you know, these two surveys were carried out at 1.4 gigahertz. VLAS is being conducted at three gigahertz. And it's also, uh, has the unique property that it's being, the survey is being done in three individual epochs. So each point of the sky will be uh, sampled and observed three times over the uh, approximately seven year lifespan of the survey. Um, now, in terms of progress, it's an ongoing survey. So the first two epochs uh, have been completed and the third epoch is going to start in January. And if you'd like to read more about the survey, I have the, the survey reference paper here. They see it all 2020. And if you are interested in data products from VLAS, I encourage you to go to serata.ca. They host uh, the cutout servers for VLAS, as well as the uh, quick look catalogs and documentation. Uh, so that is the place to go um, for all of your, your VLAS uh, quick look data needs. Um, as Shabita mentioned, we did recently have 
a science conference with VLAS. Yeah, so the name of the conference was uh, the VLA Sky Survey in the Multi-Wavelength Spotlight. Um, happy to talk about that more if people are interested. I encourage you to, to visit the website, go.nrao.edu slash VLAS22. Uh, visit the website. We have all of the um, uh, talks. We have slides from all the talks as well as recordings. We also have a virtual poster gallery still up. Uh, and if you are interested in AGN, there were a lot of AGN talks to enjoy. We had 10 talks on AGN and uh, over 30 posters. I have a few topical highlights here. We heard about radio jet life cycles and feedback. Um, we, we had uh, talks on high reg of quasars. Uh, um, I'll highlight in particular, Eduardo Bignados talked about um, a VLAS detected quasar uh, beyond reg of seven. So that was exciting. Uh, we heard about obscured AGN. Um, Pallavi Patil, who's on the call, gave a really nice talk on that. Uh, and then we also heard about uh, dual AGN uh, work that uh, combined VLAS and Gaia and uh, Emma Schwartzman. Uh, is uh, um, a GMU student, uh, is the GMU student who gave a very nice talk on that as well. Um, uh, we had uh, even more topics that I can't uh, uh, begin to include on a single slide, so please check out the conference website um, for more info. All right, so uh, back to uh, uh, the heuristics for actually finding uh, candidate newborn jets by comparing VLAS and FIRST. Uh, so uh, the goal of this project was uh, to compare FIRST and, uh, and VLAS FHUC1. So we were comparing data taken um, with FIRST between 1993 and 2011, uh, and then uh, VLAS data from 2017 to 2019. And this plot here shows the overlap between the two surveys. Uh, so VLAS observes everything above minus 40 degrees. Uh, and then uh, first, uh, the first coverage is shown here in purple. Now there are about <clears throat> 10,000 square degrees of overlap between the two surveys with about 600,000 sources matching between them. And there are thousands of VLAS sources not detected in first. And these sources are a diverse mix of uh, things like slow radio transients, such as tidal disruption events, gamma ray bursts, supernova remnants, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, slowly uh, uh, slow radio variables, sources that vary in the radio on time scales of years. Um, and this includes uh, AGN and quasars uh, most commonly. I'll also point out that among the, di among the types of sources that populate the dynamic radio sky, AGN and quasars are the dominant uh, population by, by far. All right, so to find uh, uh, radio sources with significant variability to, to suggest uh, the uh, emergence of new jets, um, we started with um, an initial sample of about 2000 sources covering 3,400 square degrees. Um, and so we, th these were sources that were not detected at first, but were, were detected in VLAS. Uh, we then cross-matched that initial sample with uh, quasar catalogs from SDSS and WISE. And then um, that got us down to about 167 quasars. Uh, we then refined our sample to include sources that had VLAS fluxes greater than three millijanskis per beam. And the goal of that was to exclude sources that were optically thick, but steady um, in the time period between first and VLAS. And so in the end, we had a sample of 26 candidate newly radio loud quasars uh, distributed on the sky, shown by these purple points here. All right, so um, as I said, we, we, the quasar catalogs we compared to um, were from SDSS and WISE. So about half of the 13 of the 26 are SDSS quasars um, in uh, the Paris et al. 2018 catalog. These are just a, a few examples of their spectra in SDSS. Um, and these, these sources, um, most of them are at redshift one or two, but they range from redshift point two uh, for the closest and redshift 3.2 for the, for the farthest source. 
Now these sources are, uh, uh, these are luminous radio sources. They have uh, luminosities in, uh, in the range of 10 to the 40 to 10 to the 42 ergs per second. Um, the, quas the actual quasars themselves, um, their bolometric luminosities are, are, are uh, in the quasar regime of 10 to the 45 to 10 to the 40, almost 10 to the 47 ergs per second. And um, for the subset of sources that for which virial supermassive black hole mass estimates are available, um, it indicates that um, we're dealing with fairly massive supermassive black holes of, of 10 to the 8 or higher solar masses. So um, this is a really interesting sample. Uh, uh, our cutouts shown here comparing first and V last. This is a, a really interesting sample to uh, to start with, but we of course knew that we could we could um, understand them a lot better with dedicated VLA follow up over a wider frequency range. So we uh, um, in 2019 we obtained um, simultaneous VLA observations spanning one to 18 gigahertz. Uh, to measure the, the radio spectral shapes and also get a, a better handle for the shorter, term, uh, shorter time scale variability. Uh, so here are a couple of plots uh, comparing the, uh, uh, showing the vari variability amplitude versus time in years on the left and in terms of months on the right. Uh, so at L band, which is 1.4 gigahertz, we, we have a constraint from, from first and then we have the 2019 uh, L band measurements, and um, they are all significantly variable on of at least a couple hundred percent. There's one extreme source that has a variability amplitude of of, of over two thousand uh, percent. So so some of them are quite extreme. At S band, over time scales of months, this is comparing the VLAS three gigahertz data point to our 2019 follow up a few months later. Um, so the, the variability is much, much more steady. And, uh, and this, be, this uh, behavior on shorter time scales of months is um, one of the key uh, factors that, that rules out a lot of other possible uh, explanations for the variability besides, uh, besides an AGN origin. Um, another key feature that we noticed um, about the sources was that they all have peaked radio spectral shapes. Uh, from 1 to 18 gigahertz. And if you plot them on a so-called radio color color diagram by plotting the, the optically thin spectral index, um, which is to, to the right of the peak against the optically thick one to the left of the peak, they all uh, land in this lower right quadrant here, um, which characterizes peaked uh, spectrum sources. So it's, uh, we, we're pretty confident in the that AGN variability is at work here, and uh, we, we've uh, we were able to rule out effects. Uh, uh, we were able to rule out origins such as propagation effects, um, uh, and tidal disruption events. And there, I'm happy to talk in more detail about that at the end, or you can refer to the paper. Um, but there are still some different possibilities for AGN uh, variability. So AGN flaring, uh, which would be blazer-like behavior. Is one explanation. Jet reorientation is another possibility. Um, so this could be caused by a supermassive black hole binary orbital motion, or possibly a jet that's being deflected by a cloud of gas, um, or potentially helical magnetic fields. Uh, and then the third possibility is uh, is uh, newborn jets that were caught um, uh, shortly after they were launched uh, decades or or perhaps centuries ago and. Uh, just became uh, easily detectable uh, recently with, when VLAS observed them. Um, I'll say that it's it's a little bit messy disentangling. Uh, it's a little bit messy ruling out the first two possibilities without long-term monitoring. Uh, but so far, uh, um, the newborn jet scenario seems to be likely for the majority of them. All right, so... Looking uh, in a bit more detail at um, uh, the radio spectral properties of these sources. So here are, are a zoom in of, of two of them. And again, you can see the, the beautiful peaked radio spectra. This is indicative of the presence of absorption. So when radio jets are compact, the electron number density is high and uh, um, you can get either synchrotron self-absorption 
or free 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 absorption. Um, yeah, in, in the latter case, uh, a high number density of thermal electrons would cause free free absorption. Um, but either way, we have uh, peaked radio spectra, so the, the source has must be compact. And um, um, yeah, so far, uh, uh, young evolving jets are the explanation that works best for the majority. Now, in terms of uh, distinguishing between different types of absorption, um, I have um, on this plot shown a couple curves, well, a few, a few curves uh, focus on the dashed line here, which represents synchrotron self-absorption. Uh, and then this dot dashed line represents free free absorption. Um, and unfortunately, the, they're a little bit ambiguous <laughs> until you get down to lower radio frequencies. Uh, and so if, to, to really um, uh, put tighter constraints on the, the, the physics, the absorption physics, um, we'll need deep sub gigahertz data with an instrument uh, such as LOFAR. Um, we also looked at the uh, um, yeah, the, connect, the potential connection with quasar reddening and mergers. Um, and so I have uh, shown on this slide here a couple of uh, wise, wise, wise color color plots uh, showing W1 minus W2 versus W2 minus W3. Uh, these are uh, color plots based on the uh, Mateos et al. 2012 study, uh, defining this wedge here of uh, space occupied by AGN. And you can see that um, all of our sources for which data is available, they all fall within that wedge. And then a few fall in this upper uh, right region shaded in purple. And uh, this is a, an area of color, of infrared color space dominated by heavily obscured luminous AGN. And so a, a couple of our sources fall in there or close to it, but clearly we need a bigger sample to, to really understand a, uh, what might be going on in terms of um, uh, you know, merger history and, and reddening, and if there, if there is perhaps any connection with uh, the um, absorption we're seeing in the radio. Uh, I think that what I would, uh, what I would love to see if, if I could, if I could find the data to, to support it is it would be really fun to find some radio jets with free free absorption because they are propagating in a, a dense ISM. But it's, uh, it's harder, harder than it sounds. Um, all right, I have a few more uh, key results uh, to highlight here, uh, and I wanna make sure I leave some time for questions. Um, but uh, we do have some constraints on the, the sizes of our sources from a relation known as the turnover size relation. Uh, so uh, if you take the, um, the frequency um, of, the, of the peak, uh, so for this source, for instance, it's about 15 gigahertz. If you plot that against uh, linear size, Young, young and compact radio jets form a, a fairly tight relation. And so uh, unfortunately, the, all of the sources in our VLA follow-up were unresolved, even down to 0.1 arc second resolution. That's the highest we got to in KU band. Um, so we, what we really need would need to test uh, their sizes, uh, put tighter constraints on them would be the something like uh, the VLBA. We would need very long baseline we would need uh, the very long baseline array or other uh, VLBI instruments. But we can sort of extrapolate uh, making some assumptions. So if we assume that these sources do fall in the relation um, and then you get a size on the order of one to 10 parsecs, you can then assume a typical jet velocity of 0.1 C and you come up with an age of 30 to 300 years, uh, which is consistent with the variability time scale that we're seeing. All right, we can also place our sources uh, in the context of the overall radio population using the so-called luminosity size diagram shown here. Uh, so this diagram tracks the evolution of radio AGN through different life stages um, from uh, parsec scale sizes uh, when they're very young to uh, you know, hundreds of kiloparsecs uh, when they're old. And so our, our sources are shown by these um, uh, magenta upper limits um, we've got these uh, rainbow arcs here representing uh, possible sizes for sources that don't have redshifts. Um, and we find that the, the size limits uh, and luminosities are consistent with other classes of compact young radio AGN, uh, such as gigahertz peak spectrum and, and uh, 
com uh, compact sweep spectrum sources. And in the future, our sources may uh, uh, grow, and so they may grow and become large radio galaxies. Uh, so they could fall on this high power track that leads to FR2s, or they could, um, some, some of them might fall on this lower power track and become FR1s. Um, if, uh, that, that's if they can live for tens of millions of years and don't run out of, uh, uh, don't run out of fuel. Uh, they, they could also quickly fade away um, uh, much earlier. And so uh, obviously we won't be able to follow these sources for uh, uh, the timescales needed to see how they'll eventually uh, grow up. But um, with more demographics and more statistics using VLAS and other radio surveys, the, the goal is to place a better constraint on that. Um, from what we do have so far, just based on the sky density alone of uh, of, of candidate newborn jets, um, it suggests a period of occurrence, which is sort of a proxy for a, a lifetime, of uh, of a hundred thousand years, and that's already quite a bit younger than has been traditionally uh, assumed. Uh, so usually we think of radio AGN as turning on and living for ten million years and then fading away. But uh, what we're seeing, um, what we're seeing with the, this population of, of young jets, is that um, short-lived jets might actually be more common than we thought, especially at redshifts one to three. And um, um, in addition to that, it's they may be triggered, uh, re-triggered frequently, and that could mean that an opportunity for um, uh, sort of. Uh, a low intensity but repetitive feedback over long periods of time, long periods of cosmic history that might actually influence galaxy evolution significantly. Um, and and I, I should also emphasize that uh, what we're finding, what we found with uh, this VLAS and first comparison looking for young jets in the time domain, it is consistent with the emerging picture we're seeing um, with deep uh, you know, very deep, high angular resolution radio surveys being done right now with low fire, and so that's that's been really exciting. That was an exciting outcome of the the VLAS conference. Um, so we have some. I'll try to go a little bit more quickly here. We have some additional follow up to to track the radio spectral variability of of these sources. Um, and some preliminary. I have some preliminary analysis shown here. Most of them are, they, they have steady spectral shapes over time scales of, of about a year. A couple of them show a very, uh, very interesting increase just in the optically thick flux over a year, which is exactly what you would expect for an adiabatically ex ex expanding source. And then we do have a couple oddballs that have very bizarre uh, spectral shapes that um, with, with peaks that go to higher frequency that may be, um, beamed and and doing what I like to call blazer antics. All right, so we've got a ton of follow-up in progress. Um, I will highlight um, at this group that we, we do have a little bit of Chandra data uh, that I've been working on, and we just had new HST observations taken uh, last week. We have um, um, HST uh, observing time for uh, for four of them. And the, the goal there is to, to look at um, host uh, properties. All right, um, I'm just about out of time, but I will end on, um, uh, I'll go over these last two, two slides really quick. I just wanna put in another plug again for the VLAS conference. Um, so uh, as Shavita mentioned, I, I think she mentioned, I, I was the SOC chair. We also have the LOC chair, Pallavi Patil on the line. Um, please check out the website if you'd like to watch any of the talks or review any of the material. It's all public now. And um, there's a lot of exciting science uh, possible with, with um, uh, precursors to the square kilometer array and also pathfinders, a lot of acronyms down here. Um, but there's, there's a lot to look forward to. I'm happy to talk about the NGVLA and Deep Synoptic Array 2000 if anyone's interested later. And I will... Uh, leave my summary slide up here, and uh, please let me know if you have any questions or would like to chat about anything after the talk. Thanks.
Great. Thank you so much, Christina. Let's give Christina a round of applause for a fantastic talk. That was that was wonderful, Christina. Um, I have tons of questions, but of course I will save mine for the end. Uh, questions, anybody? Um, Bobby? Hi, Christina. Thank you. That was a, that was a really great talk. Um, on your slide, I think it was slide 37, maybe, where you were showing the mid-infrared um, characteristics of your sources. Um, we recently had a, or a result in our group where we found that a lot of uh, like dust obscured um, galaxies tend to have more um, morphologically disturbed like stellar light distributions. Um, and so I wanted to ask if you looked at all into kind of like the stellar light characteristics of the host galaxies. That's a really interesting question. Um, I hadn't thought about that. When you say the stellar light properties, um, uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. So I just, for example, like um, SDSS morphologies, um, asymmetries or, um, you know, Gene M20, this kind of thing. Um, maybe just with the the possibility that these might be like merging systems, for example, um, it'd be super cool to find uh, like an active jet in in a merging galaxy. Yeah, that's a really good question. So that's that was one of the main goals of the HST proposal that we got time on. So it's um, uh, yeah, quantifying the host galaxy morphologies uh, after subtracting out the dominant quasar component. Uh, I think is going to be really exciting. So. Um, yeah, one has been observed, three more are still left to observe. I think for most of them, we, we really need um, the modeling the quasar um, in the optical and, and successfully removing it uh, is, is a really good case for, for needing HST um, or perhaps other powerful space telescopes like James Webb. Um, but yeah, we, we I don't think that we can do too much with it from the ground, but I'd be happy to talk with, with other experts in this area. Thanks. Abhi and Neil? Yeah, uh, great talk, Christina. Um, I had a question about uh, whether kind of the, the, the picture, the overall lifetime picture that you were kind of hinting at at the end there. So you have these this kind of recurrence time scale of 100,000 years, but you were saying that the radio jets typically last tens of millions of years is that right I, I don't I guess I don't know that time scale very well so yeah that's what people that I believe that's what's commonly assumed and also uh, um, a number that I believe goes into um, like cosmological simulations okay I guess I was you were also mentioning that there's you know one to ten percent of objects are are radio loud and so I guess it makes sense that you know you would be seeing the birth of these objects because there's a bunch of them that don't don't have any radio emission. So I guess I'm just trying to understand, do you, is your idea that the most of these will probably cease, like they're just a single burst, like an impulsive burst, and then they'll they'll cease and then they'll and then they'll kind of just fade out on and I guess I was wondering on what time scale if they just would would you expect that to happen? Yeah, so we just have so we don't have um enough statistics to do anything too sophisticated. So we just have a, a period of occurrence. So just basically the 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 assuming a um you know a, a variability turn on time of 20 years and, and dividing that by the um uh, by the fraction um is, is pretty much what we did. And so we sort of used as a reference uh we looked at the number of of radio AGN uh identified uh in, in first. So, um, so first gets you something like 15 to 20 uh, radio quasars per square degree. And uh, we see a little bit more than that. So they're more common. So the number of candidate newborn jets, uh, uh, we're seeing too many if, 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 the, S, if the first number of, of radio EGN defined in a single epoch is uh, representative of, of the overall radio EGN population. Does that make sense? Yeah, if they all last 10 million years, there's way too yeah. many. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was a very simple thing that we did, but it is it has been interesting to see other studies uh, sort of independently come up with uh, um, uh, like uh, recurrence time scales of, on the order of tens of thousands of years 
to 100,000 years, you know, which, which is considerably less than 10 million. So I, I think it's, it's um, an area where potentially we were sort of biased by the, the biggest and brightest radio AGN uh, that dominated low redshift and are hosted by massive elliptical galaxies. Um, those, those probably do have typical lifetimes that are you know, older, you know, millions of years. Uh, but when you go out to higher redshift, like redshift one to two, where things are more interesting, I think that's really unexplored territory. And there, there's a lot to be discovered in what's in sources that maybe were traditionally considered radio quiet or maybe appeared radio quiet just because when they would happen to be observed, they hadn't uh, recently launched a launched a jet. <laughs> so yeah, I, guess, I guess my, uh, but just to, sorry, uh, but the how long if if no more extra emission happened how long would these be visible for how long would these be counted? Uh, that's a good question um let's see i have i have a i have a helpful slide but i don't have it handy so that is a question that depends on which uh, on the properties of your telescope as much almost as much as it does on the properties of the source so they do fade over time scales of, of decades considerably and their peaks uh well, they can they can fade or they can continue to increase for a while, but their peaks will shift to lower and lower frequencies. Um, it, this this would probably not happen over, you know, time scales of an astronomer's lifetime. But um, I would say, uh, I don't know, thousands of years, okay. hundreds of years until we couldn't see them with a VLAS like telescope. Thanks. If, that, if that helps answer your question. Jim? Yes, sorry. Sorry, I missed a tiny bit of the talk, so I hope you didn't say this, but did you look at the opposite problem of the ones that turned off in that same time period? I didn't mention it, but that's a really good question. It's related uh, to the previous set of questions from Anil. It is a good question. Um, so the short answer is other people are working on that. And I, I have left them to it as it is, uh, in some cases, PhD thesis material. But it is a valid thing to do. It's more difficult because um, to find sources that have turned off, you would ideally, uh, you, would, you would ideally want VLAS, I think, to be a little bit more sensitive because uh, most radio sources in the sky have these optically thin power law spectral indices. So like um, the, the canonical non-thermal radio spectral index is like alpha of minus 0.7. And so if you can plot that in your head and imagine um, like where the cutoff would be for finding sources that turned on versus turned off, it's you're, you're going to more easily be able to prove that a source uh, turned off rather than, or you'll, you'll be more easily able to identify sources that have turned on, um, then you'll be able to turn identify the turn off ones because they will, they could be mistaken for like a, a steep spectrum source that you just can't constrain with VLAS. Thank you. Ms. Jim, Anik. Um. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anik. Uh, I am a Mason, George Mason student uh, in my final year of the uh, PhD. Uh, I am. I cannot exp express myself like how excited I am seeing this talk because, uh, and it's a great talk, uh, Christina. First of all, um, I am exactly working in similar topic, uh, but you like the one to ten percent of radio loud, but in my case, I like the rest of the ninety percent, which are radio quiet guys. So I am observing uh, the radio quiets uh, in VLVA in multibands from L to C to X to K band. So I observe uh, all these uh, very close nearby because our rate shift are very small. You, you're, you're talking about mostly one to three, but mine is very, very smaller, like 0.08 or something. So in, in those cases, I also see this, the, uh, the number of peak spectra stuff is coming again and again. And uh, we are really, uh, really, I mean, so far, we don't really understand 100% that uh, what is the physical reason behind this pig, you know, like, because we always talk about radio loud, quiet, the pre, pre absorption of synchrotronic stuff, uh, self, synchrotron self-absorption, uh, but we really don't know the answer uh, exactly. Um, and we just, I just keep looking at the literature and we find out that 
uh, we, we keep uh, explaining the different spectral shape and, and some few um, physical explanation, uh, for example, what you explained. Uh, but what do you think really happening uh, those peaked spectrum AGN. Even in VLV, I see it's a very small angular resolution. It's like less than one per sec, so sub per sec scale. And I still see the same thing. I see the gigahertz peak guys um, um, is the most abundant uh, in the AGN. So um, I mean, like I'm talking a lot, but it's very exciting for me because it's going to be my PhD uh, topic or uh, maybe dissertation topic. So. My first question is how uh, you separate the free free absorption from the synchrotron self absorption. And you showed that two, one plot, they have like more uh, going towards the L band. It's like a spike to the uh, L band. So this is the first question. And basically, and the second question is like you talk about the, the shift of the peak with the time uh, for these guys. But I saw one one plot you showed from 2016 to 19 is basically uh, the shifting is going in the other way, right? If I'm not uh, incorrect, so I don't get that thing also. So if you can explain those things, and uh, I really like to discuss more about this stuff. Uh, hopefully, I'll meet you in Marlam meeting because I'm going to the Marlam as well uh, in in the 21st October. So so thank you so much for the talk, and I really appreciate. It. And if you can answer this question, that's great. Great, great. Just yeah. super quick answers. Um, we know the functional forms for synchrotron self-absorption and free-free absorption. Uh, Pallavi Patil has a really nice paper with details on the modeling, including um, including the, all the equations that describe these, these different absorption mechanisms. But most compact radio AGN that we know of, um, most can be explained by synchrotron self-absorption, which is basically just having your non-thermal synchrotron emitting electrons packed in really close together and so the emission basically you know, you can't get out. <laughs> um, and if you want to distinguish between SSA and FFA, what you really need is to uh, very accurately model um, both sides of the peak, but really in the optically thick part, um, like left of the peak is, is important. And that often means you need sensitive low frequency data. Um, and really the only player in the game that can reach the sensitivities needed is low far. So for your sources, low far would be really interesting, uh, especially the International Low Far Telescope with high resolution. And then the last part of your question was, oh, you were asking about the source where the peak got uh, increased. So that's Blazar ant that that is Blazar antics, quote unquote, in action. Um, what happens is um, due to like magnetic field instabilities or a new blob of plasma launched along the jet, you basically uh, uh, and also beaming effects uh, factor in a lot. Um, we 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 have a, a, um, a different population of electrons contributing to the spectral shape, and so it changes. Um, that's that's a sh a, a, the shortest answer I can give, but we can talk more about it offline. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so I just want to mention that for more detailed questions, uh, there's a link in the chat uh, for. Uh, you know, time, additional time if Christina has time to um, to talk with our students. So feel free to join that. And and Christina, I can just ask a few questions, but I wanted all of us to thank Christina. I don't want to keep everyone past the hour um, for a fantastic talk. It was very, very informative. Um, 